So you're ready to start your vocation. You're looking for marriage, want to settle down, have a beautiful little Catholic family. And you're like, okay, God, let's go. Uh, but uh, one detail, like, where's my soulmate? You know, where is she? Where is he? I've been going to the young adult community meetings and I'm not finding anything there. I'm going to the gym, uh, you know, are they are not quite the right type I'm looking for. Like, what am I doing wrong, God? Like, did, are, you, are you like punishing me in my loneliness because some dumb decision I made in college? Or like, you know, what what's going on here? Like, should I never have broken up with that one guy? Was he the right soulmate? And I, I just missed him. Like, did I do not do the right novena? I mean, I tried the one to Raphael the Archangel. He's not answering my messages. You know, should I, should I do one to Joseph? You just start torturing yourself of just like, God, is the problem me? You know, is it like a Taylor Swift? It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. Like, or is it you got like, what, what is going on here? Sometimes the state of just frustration loneliness, uh, the, the cocktail of disappointment and, and lack of clarity it makes you wonder, okay, well, was I supposed to be a priest? Like, I don't want to be a priest. Maybe he does want me. Man, the questions that can swirl in your mind while you're patiently waiting on God for your vocation to unfold. And so today, we're going to dive into nothing but this. The questions that singles have in terms of waiting on God, wondering what his plan is for their life and how they can discover that and live it out. And uh, to help us do this, will be the founder of Blessed Is She, uh, Jenny Gazar. Um, but before we dive in, one again, always thank the patrons on Patreon who make this podcast available. I know you guys are watching, you guys are listen listening, and so just always want to thank you. And if any of you watching want to support this uh, podcast, uh, please become a member of the community there. You just click on the link on the show notes. Uh, just patreon.com slash Jason Ebert. You can join the community. We'll send you all kinds of free stuff, give you early access to the uh, podcast episodes. And if I come to town in your area, we'll do dinner together. I was just over in Rome and one of the patrons reached out like, hey, I heard you're coming to Rome. You want to do dinner? I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's meet at this uh, restaurant. The Swiss Guard recommended to me, had some amazing carbonara. So you want to get to know us personally, communicate with us on a personal way through email. Uh, you can support the cause through patreon.com slash Jason Everett. But with that having been said, let, let's dive into this. Let's get into the mess and the thick of the challenges of discovering what God is up to while you're waiting on your vocation. As I had mentioned, uh, Jenny, Jenna, the founder of Blessed Is She, is going to help us do this. So Jenna, thank you for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to be here. Now, I know a lot of our listeners are already very familiar with the work that you guys are doing over there at Blessed Is She, but could you kind of give us a little flyover of uh, the ministry, why you started it, and, and what exactly it does? Yeah, thank you. Um, Blessed is she is an online Catholic women's ministry, and it was really started after I started my young family with my husband. Um, I went from that kind of young adult and having a lot of young adult ministry that parishes into this phase where I find kind of I felt kind of stuck in the middle. I was like no longer a young adult going all the same stuff, and I was not going to like the older women's defense ministry. Um, and I wanted a place for me, I wanted a place where I could talk with other women, other Catholic women about scripture in particular, um, and talk about the faith. And so I whipped out that little website, um, around 30 women, if they would be open to writing about scripture every single day. So every day we send out a little reflection based on the daily text reading. Yeah. Um, and it's just a way to unpack what the Lord is speaking to us um, as women in scripture, because he's talking to us mm -hmm. right now today, and we want to open up the Bible and hear what he has to say. That's awesome. Now, so I imagine a good portion of your women are married, raising their families, and then a significant portion single, still looking? Yes, a lot. Yeah, we host events all around the country and the world, and that's really where we get to meet just a wide first why what's that word i'm looking for why the range yeah all kinds of women in different ages and stages so mm -hmm. um college girls 18 year olds all the way up to grandmothers even moms and daughters come that can't come to retreat at times so it's really beautiful to be able to talk to this whole gamut of women who are all really in pursuit of jesus of his purification in our hearts of what he's in our lives so it's really yeah. And for today's show, I know guys will be tuning in as well because they're struggling with this, but it almost seems to me like there's a predominant template of a single Catholic young adult woman in her, you know, 20s, 30s, maybe 40s. Um, 
but predominantly 20s, 30s, and uh, she's living a good life. She's not bar hopping and drinking and be like, oh, where's my knight in shining armor? And like, like, she's following the Lord. She's just open to his will. She's pursuing her life. She's involved in good things. She's kind of putting herself out there. Um, and, and she's just coming up empty constantly and scratching her head. I got an email from a, a woman yesterday, and I don't think she would mind me sharing this anonymously, um, that she emailed me just kind of out of the blue and kind of expressed her frustration. I even told her, hey, make sure to watch the show because I want to give her an opportunity to hear what you might say to her heart. She said that she goes already, she goes to Catholic young adult community meetings and she says, you know, I get all ready and I, I do my makeup, I get my hair all nice. And then I go to these things and I just come home every single time, just kind of just disappointed and alone. And she says, when I go to prayer on this, I just feel like I'm just not hearing God. And she said, like, is this, I don't even know what his will is for me at this point. She said, I feel hopeless. She said, is that still normal, you know, in your thirties? Or there's some people who just don't even have a vocation at all. And, you know, it, it's not like she's asking for too much. It's like, no, I just want to meet a guy who believes in God. He doesn't look at porn and he's not socially awkward. Okay. Like, is that really too much to ask? It, it, and she'll go to these, you know, probably Catholic adult community meetings. And like, she might find a guy who meets one and two, like, okay, good. He's not looking at porn and he believes in God, but he's like, hey, do you like scapulars? I like scapulars. Like, oh, this guy's just awkward. Like, why can't I just meet, meet someone all three of those things? Not too much to ask. And so what would you speak? What would you pour into that woman's heart? It kind of feels like she's doing her part, uh, but she's just coming up empty. Yeah. Well, I just want to say you are so seen by the Lord. Um, I do like, I don't want to discount that it actually is a really difficult thing to date nowadays. I think social media has made it extremely difficult. Obviously dating apps have made it extremely difficult. The culture is just different than it was 10 years ago. Um, and a lot of people are socially awkward. A lot of men have never actually asked a woman out on a date with their voice. Like they've never actually said it out. Um, so you're not making that up. <laughs> it's yeah. not um, like something that you're like, am I the only one experiencing this? This is part of the culture right now. And Lord, come through and, and raise up a generation of men who um, can pursue women in a really beautiful way, the way that you've done, Lord. Um, but in all of that, you aren't alone. There are a lot of women who are experiencing just what you're experiencing. And I know when I have um, just talked to my friends, especially talked to women who have been experiencing this, the first thing that came to mind as you were sharing that data and as you are, are sharing this difficulty is the Lord is so with you in that unseen. Um, I think the Lord is so attracted to the parts of us that feel empty or that's exactly where he wants to be. That's exactly where he wants to fill us with us. Um, and so in all things, which I would love to get into the practical also, but just the heart level to say um, in all things, no matter our vacation, no matter what phase in life we're in, that we would continue to pursue the giver and not his gifts. Mm. So, not so much, Lord, what are you giving me or um, how will you come through in this area in terms of what I'll just, but God, I just want to, I want to be one with your heart. I want to pursue your heart. And I know that so much fear that you yeah. that die for sure. Yeah, no, that, I mean, that, that taps into an, quite an ache of just like, okay, I know, I know I should be doing this, but my, but the ache is so good, right? And, and it's so real because like when I travel and I, you know, maybe I'll pop into a church and a noonday mass and, you know, there's a half a dozen young adults, single women there at mass. And I'm just not seeing the guys there. And, you know, granted, there might be one or two, whatever, but it just seems like this disproportionate number. And I think a lot of women are in that camp of just like, okay, God, I, I am pursuing you first. I, I am meeting you, but man, this ache is not going away. And, and you wonder like, does he see me? Like, am I just like invisible to God? Because I could totally go against the will of God and find a boyfriend in three minutes on some app. But I know it's not going to ultimately fulfill me because the emptiness and loneliness you feel in the wrong relationship is so much more profound than the loneliness uh, of singleness, where at least there's a hope of tomorrow. But uh, how God is seeing you this morning, I was spending a little bit of time in adoration. And I 
Um, I'm just going through the Bible a little bit at a time until I get to the end, and I just kind of start over and do this thing. And so I'm in the middle of Maccabees, and I come to one of the best chapters in the Bible, which is Second Maccabees chapter 7, which is the martyrdom of the seven sons and the mob under this, this uh, you know, pagan ruler. And it, what hit me there, I just want to read this to, to anybody suffering right now, anybody who's like, God, where are you in my midst? Listen to this. So these guys and her mom, they're not going to eat the, the food that they're not supposed to eat, and the king gets all cranky about it. But listen to what happens is, the king fell into a rage, and he gave orders that pans and cauldrons be heated. Uh, these were heated immediately, and he commanded that the tongue of the spokesman, which is like the first son, be cut out. And then they scallop him and cut off his hands and feet while the rest of the brothers and the mother looked on. When he was utterly helpless, and you just think about that, utterly helpless. This guy's got no tongue. I mean, sorry to be graphic, but the blood has got to be pouring out of his mouth and down his scalp all over his face. He, he can't stand because he literally has no feet, can't catch himself. He's got no hands, so he's utterly helpless. Um, and it says, the king ordered them to take him to the fire, still breathing. So he's barely breathing. He's just, you know, a mess. And they fried him in a pan. And the smoke from the pan spread widely. But the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, the Lord God is watching over us and in truth has compassion on us. As Moses declared in his song, which he bore witness against the people to their faces, when he said he will have compassion on his servants. and. You know, I read that verse this morning. I'm like, okay, no matter what I'm going through right now, that like he sees you and he's having compassion on you. Even if you feel scalped with your tongue cut off, your limbs cut to pieces and you're frying in a pan that's smoking, he has compassion on you. And these are the words that Moses bore witness against the Israelites, probably while they're wandering for 40 years in the desert in a, in a trip that should have taken like a week, a week and a half to make but that he sees you, that he's having compassion on you. And so that word kind of just came to me this morning, like that things could literally be that bad. And the truth of the matter is that he sees you and he's having compassion on you. Like this is the mystery of faith to actually praise him from the pan. You know, when, when you, be, and, the, and the way that they justify this is just like, look, he's going to show mercy to our descendants. He's going to show mercy to us. As soon as we pass away, we'll have this eternal reward. And so, Sometimes I think, well, if I'm not getting that reward on my timetable, that I'm invisible to God, but in the midst of the suffering and the smoke, he has compassion on you. So uh, I don't know. That's a word that came to me. I don't know if that's something you try to get across to the, the people struggling to praise God, even through the midst of the loneliness. Yes, that's exactly it. That the Lord is so big in the area that we are weak or that we're in need. That's exactly where he's glorified. Um, and I just want to also instill hope, um, that you you do have a vocation. It's not that you were skipped over in the vocation line. Like you do have a vocation. The Lord has a plan for you. Um, whether that be religious life, whether that be marriage, but whatever that call is, he will be glorified along the way. He will, um, quench to be served along the way. And I think oftentimes, especially with vocation, it can feel like all I want is the end game. Like once I get the end game, everything will feel better. I'll like finally feel quenched. I'll finally feel satisfied. Um, but every step along the way, he wants to satisfy us. Yeah. Again, no matter our vocation or faith in our vocation, every step along the way, he wants to satisfy. So not when we finally get engaged, not when we finally get married. No, it's, it's right now today he wants yeah. to satisfy every single place. Um, but yeah, just want to want to give hope. You weren't passed over. Yeah. Uh, it's not that that you messed up and that guy in college. Oh, if I had only said yes to that date. No, the Lord has a plan, um, and His will is your life right now. And all we have to do is just be one. Yeah, and I think that's the challenge is that like that psalm of like, you know, find your delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. And it's like, okay, God, I delight in you. Now can I have what I want? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, 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 no. You know, and, and it's and it's hard because it's like, okay, am I desiring him for getting what I want? Or am I desiring him because he's the only thing that can ultimately satisfy me in the end? And I, I think for men or women kind of pursuing it, some of them I think are checking all the boxes. Like, look, I'm pursuing God. I'm doing this. I'm staying mentally fit, physically fit, spiritually fit. Um, 
But maybe some people, maybe there's some roadblocks for some that are like, hey, have you checked this thing off the list yet? Because we are like, okay, God, what are you waiting for? Sometimes God's answer is like, well, well, you, like you're not ready to receive what I want to give you. And that's not always the case. I think some people are very disposed and well-received, but I'm, I'm thinking of potential roadblocks, like maybe healing that has to take place in their lives. You know, what would you recommend to men or women who, who want the vocation towards marriage and really feel called to it, not just desire it, but really feel like, no, I feel like this is what God made me for, but maybe there's some wounds that they're kind of afraid of diving into. What would you say to maybe encourage uh, men, women that maybe have some stuff that needs to get addressed, how they can kind of deal with that stuff instead of expecting marriage to be a bit of a car wash? Mm. That's, a good, that's a good analogy. Um, I do want to say God is a good father. So we as his children are going to be uh, purified by him. He will discipline us in, in a loving and perfect way. Um, so yeah, oftentimes that is like, oh, I had some wounds in here that God actually wants to work with me. He wants to reveal to me and heal. And that takes time. Um, I mean, oftentimes God can do it. He can do it in an instant. He can heal whenever it may his own timing. Um, but sometimes it does take a month, year, decade for, for that healing to continue in our heart. Um, so on a practical level, I just want to highly recommend, um, counseling and, and therapy, um, to be able to talk to someone about any of your wounds that have come up in the past and I think, I don't know, uh, Jason, you can speak better to this, but sometimes I think men especially have a harder time kind of thinking about maybe some older wounds. Like, it's just like, yeah, well, I got to keep going and going to work. Like, I'm yeah. just doing stuff. And, and women, too, I think there's so many responsibilities that we have that you can kind of yeah. put that to the wayside and say, like, I don't want to deal with that. And so uh, I'm not going to. I'm not even going to sit down and and pursue do maybe healing in this in these various areas. Yeah. Um, but that is like God is in the business of healing. He is yeah. a healer. Um so yeah, I, I think counseling and therapy is huge. I've really heard great things about um like uh what's that called? Like spiritual prayer ministry where uh-huh. you do like healing ministry basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, with like trusted advisors. I yeah. think that can kind of get into some of the scary areas at times, but yeah. really trusted people who um, know what they're doing and who can pray with you on your healing journey. Yeah. And ones that would come up to my mind, um, catholictherapist.com. You just type in your zip code, find a counselor in your area. A lot of them will even do remote counseling. And Dr. Bob shoots the stuff that he's doing with the John Paul II Healing St- Center, Catholic Psych with Dr. Greg Bataro. Like the resources are out there. And I think sometimes God might be waiting on us, knowing full well that I mean, one of the things that can actually be an impediment to forming a sacramental bond is an inability to uh, to fulfill the essential obligations of marriage. Meaning like, can I fully give and receive another? Am I able to, to psychologically do this? Or am I just looking for this person to literally complete this part of me that's half missing? And so, you know, in some cases, I think this is what God's waiting on is, is that healing. I mean, other times people are like, no, 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 I haven't gone through any severe trauma. You know, yeah, I've got my imperfections, but like I, I, I'm, I've done that stuff. I think another impediment that some people, in particular women, I think the guy's impediment is just like, hey, I'll, I'll take care of it later. I'll find my vocation later. And they're kind of just kicking it down the road. I mean, some women do that, but there comes a point for some women are like, okay, time's up. I did career. I did this. I, I, I failed to prioritize well. I think the the more common thing might be with some women um, of just a passivity sometimes of just like, okay, God will bring him to me. You know, he'll come, he'll come, he'll come. It, where she's not making herself really available, she's not going out to where the good guys are. Could you g- maybe give some practical tips of how a woman might be able to overcome maybe some insecurities or shyness to kind of put herself out there in the right place, in the right way to the right kind of people? Yeah. Well, a big deal to me personally is friendship. So that would be a female friendship or an actual, like, I think that's a really good stepping stone to putting yourself out there. So maybe cultivating some female friendships where you have um, safety and a foundation um, of both trusting and knowing the Lord. Um, 
we have a lot of resources at Leslie. She if they need that in terms of like how to cultivate female friendships. But um, even just going to mass and coffee, because the reason I say that that's a stepping stone is I think a female friend is so helpful um, when it comes to being great and stepping out into other areas. Yeah. So whether that be, hey, I want to join an adult fourth league, but yeah. I don't want to just sign up with no, like I don't know anyone, you know. Yeah. But if I had a friend who I could go sign up with, you now have this to do it with mm-hmm. you. If you want to join yeah. a hiking club, if you want to go to, like here in the valley in Arizona, there's Catholic beer club. So it's so much easier to, to be a part of these things when you have someone to come along with you. So if maybe you have been hitting roadblocks where you're like. That is so outside of my realm. I would never go to that myself. Mm-hmm. Maybe just to back up a little bit and say like, oh, are there some female friends that I could cultivate a friendship with? And then say, hey, can you join me on these things? Can we yeah. step out together? I just think that's so helpful. Also, um, I think having married female friends is really important too. Like, yeah. I, for, in my case, I have single girlfriends and all I do all the time is like put on my goggles where are the single men? I'm looking for everyone yeah. I'm, to connect all of my friends with yeah. all the single men who exist. Like your friends mm-hmm. for you. Too. Yeah. Um, so even if it's not a single friend, if you're like, I'm only surrounded by married people, great. Befriend yeah. those married people. They can get to know you. Their husbands can get to know you. Their family can get to know you. And then as men, um, yeah. uh, we can kind of be those connecting points for you too. Yeah. And, and I think one place to start looking is you could call your diocesan offices, ask for whoever's in charge of like the young adult ministry and say, hey, you know, where do I go? And they're like, oh, St. Martin's Parish on this side of town has a thriving young adult community. That's one way to get plugged in. You get on these email newsletters. Hey, we got salsa dancing this day and softball that day. You can get plugged in. And if nothing exists, like, look, I live in Podunk, wherever, start something, uh, you know, like get something going because you might need to be the one who stands up at the end of the Sunday Mass and say, hey, we're starting a young adult group. We're going to be meeting on Wednesday nights down here, there. Maybe maybe it's waiting on you to get one of these things up and going. Because like you said, sometimes it's not so much that you meet the right guy at this place, but you can meet the right girls there. And they might have a cute brother who's Catholic, you know, who's going back into town. Like, like just, just put yourself out there instead of expecting it just totally up to God. Because, I mean, there's got to be a balance there, right? It can't be like, okay, this is my job to make it happen. Versus the opposite extreme of just like, I don't have to do anything. God's just going to drop it in my lap. And there's, there's truth to that. I think of that, that psalm that says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor do so in vain. You know, it's vain for you to put off your rest at night, to eat your bread and toil. God gives all of this to his beloved while they sleep. And so it kind of shows this, this active receptivity of trusting God that will bring it, but it, but it's an active receptivity. And so, um, so let's say a person's dealing with their stuff. Uh, they've gone through healing, they're putting their self out there, they're making self available, and it's it's still not happening. You know, at, at what point should a person start looking at online dating? Is it just is there is that a bad thing? Are there good ones, bad ones? Like, what would you recommend? Because a lot of people are like, look, in my workplace, with my hours and my social circles, the odds of finding a devout Catholic man who's gonna want to raise saints with me has just been slim to none. Uh, whereas if I could tap into some of these Catholic online dating communities, maybe it kind of broadens the horizons you see what happens. But, you know, the challenge there is some people have just been burned there. Like, look, I tried that, you know, and I got on there and the requests that we're getting, the guy's like, hey, I'm Catholic. When, when did you go to church last? Well, when I was baptized, I think it was like a week old or something. Like, like, so what would you say, what counsel would you give in terms of online dating? Yeah, I mean, I think Catholic Match is amazing. I've seen really successful couples yeah. come from that, marriages come from that. So I think that's really beautiful. Um, in terms of secular dating, uh, that's where I struggle a little bit. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's kind of crazy over there. I don't, I don't know about going to like secular dating. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, if that, like, ultimately we want someone who's gonna, who's going to lead us closer to Christ. Mm-hmm. Um, and so typically we want to find someone who's maybe even a little bit further along spiritually who can lead us in that direction in terms of women with, um, but yeah, I mean, Catholic Match is amazing. I think there's another, like Ave Maria has another DD app mm-hmm. also. Yeah. Um, and then again, around here, there's Catholic speed dating, which I actually think is really cool. And it's funny that you say that, Jason. One of my friends um, wasn't able to make a Catholic speed dating event and it wasn't really in her part of town. So she just thought, well, I'll just do it myself. Like, I'll just start. 
And so she made a little Google form and people shared it on Facebook and Instagram um, and with our friends and family. And people find out and went to a Catholic dating event at the parish. Um, and so I know, again, that, that might feel like a step, um, but the Lord will be with us every step of the way. It's just one step at a time. So if there isn't anything in this area, maybe see at your parish if your pastor would be willing to, to let you do a little night event at the at the church and just put feelers out there. But can, yeah, stop. can you explain um, for those who might not be familiar what speed dating is? Because most people are like that sounds like most of my relationship. You <laughs> know, like date for like two days. So. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So I, I mean, I've never been, but I hear that. Um, they, it's basically like you sit down with another person, you have, I want to say like three to five minutes and you oh, just wow. talk to each other. Yeah. Um, so you talk to each other and then they ring the bell and then you go to the back. Okay. Does yeah. that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So then at this particular one, how they kind of did it was at the end of the night, they would write down, um, the guy's names and a girl's name, the guy's names that you click. And okay. by purpose, the guys would write down the girls' names that they lived with. Okay. And they would all be collected by my moderator. Okay. So the girls and guys weren't seeing each other's answers. Um, they would okay. all be collected. And then they reach out to the guy and say, hey, here. Oh. These were a yeah. connection. Um, so then it's really on the, the guy's drive effort to reach yeah. out to the gal um, and ask her to date. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it sounds good because I think a lot of people are afraid. Just to the high pressure stakes in a sense, especially maybe in some of the smaller young adult communities that, okay, if he asks, if I ask her on a date, everybody's going to think we're engaged practically. And so kind of, I'm afraid I don't even know where to begin, but this kind of takes the pressure off and you can just kind of fly through and, you know, Hey, you know, you know, maybe that girl didn't end up liking you the way you liked her, but Hey, you ended up liking seven girls and two of them liked you. Well, Hey, that's two more than liked you than yesterday. You know, you know, win, win there. So that's a smart thing in terms of the online dating. Um, there, what I've heard in terms of the feedback from the singles I've talked to is that the bigger the Catholic dating site is, you know, yeah, there's more possibilities, but there's a, a greater disparity in terms of the amount of faith or lack thereof of the pe- participants. So something like Catholic singles, Catholic match probably have a lot more people, but I know good marriages that have come from that. Um, smaller ones such as Ave Maria singles or Catholic chemistry.com. I would say get on all of them. You know, like, see what happens. I think this technology could be a gift. And obviously, it could lead to some disappointment. But in the end, there's, you know, they say there's no such thing as online dating, but there is online meeting. And so, you know, who knows what could pan out. And so I I would say that that's another way of making yourself available. But if a person, let's say, tries that, they're facing their healing, they're making themselves available online, in person, virtually, everywhere, and it still ain't happening. You know, I think the temptation could be to lower your morals of just be like, maybe I'm just too picky. Maybe what my friend said is true that like, I just need to let go of this little 11 year old mentality that I'm going to have this knight shining armor. And, you know, my friend didn't marry that guy and, and he has issues, but they've got a relatively functional marriage. And like, maybe I'm holding up God by having unrealistic standards of morality. What would you say to the heart of somebody who might be thinking that their morals and their standards are the problem? Yeah. Well, I do see some truth to both sides. Mm-hmm. I do think there can be a level of he's got to be six feet tall. Yeah. He has to have dark hair and blue eyes. Yeah. Like, I think at times we can fantasize yeah. um, that this perfect person. Yeah. He could be yeah. five, six, hazel eyes, brown hair. And that's fine. Okay. You know? Yeah. yeah. And so ultimately, I, um, would recommend to maybe just really take an honest look at the standards that you are in pursuit of. Um, because the first one, in my opinion, is, is he faithful? Does he love the Lord? Yeah. Um, is he pursuing God's heart? And by versa, obviously, is she faithful? Is she pursuing God's heart? Um, and look will change always. They will ebb and flow throughout our entire lives. Um, and character matters, mm-hmm. you know, like yeah. a, a big deal to me is humor. <laughs> yeah. like, those are things that are really important. Will they make me laugh? Like, is this yeah. going to be a joyful experience? Because man, will there be tough times? Yeah. Um, but to be able to have the Lord front and center, 
So on that note, I say no. You, in terms of having too high of a standard when it comes to is this a godly man? Yeah. I don't think so. I think um, the Lord is is putting on your heart that you need someone who um, is going to put people. And so if there's someone where you're like, they just don't even know him or um, they're yeah. atheists or agnostic, yeah. that is yeah. not too high of a standard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the, the standard can be, I want someone who believes in what I believe in, who's going to pursue God's heart, <laughs> to hold the same world that I do. Yeah. Now, how does a person discern in terms of, okay, nobody's perfect. Um, you know, and he's got a little rough around the edges, but you know, how, how do you know when it's like, okay, is this a deal breaker or not? Um, you know, how can a person discern, am I being too picky? Cause yeah, I mean, as I see it, you, you, the only person you want to marry is your best friend. And sometimes you just need to look at how does this pe- person make me feel? Does this make person make me feel better than anyone else in the world or kind of worse than anyone else in the world? Like when I wake up in the morning, there's, there's stress on my mind over just the, how tumultuous this relationship is and the emotional roller coaster that it's been. It, it, sometimes I think we get so hung up on who we thought the person was or who we hope they'll be that we're kind of blind that who they actually are. And then, you know, you'll even have couples take these like marriage prep classes and like you have these focus tests and it's like red flag, red flag, red, red flag. And it's like, okay, well, those are the points that are going to change if I just love them un- enough. And, but, you know, typically decades down the road, I mean, you could take the same test and it would look identical because personalities typically don't change. And so, you know, things that I would look at is like, are you guys really truly best friends? Like, do you treat each other just absolute reverence, respect, you know, compassion? Uh, you know, maybe he's not as religious as you. Maybe maybe he doesn't go to daily mass. But is there at least that just not just willingness for you to drag him to church, but a, a sincere openness to, 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 to go with you to adoration, to start to open his heart and, and, and see what happens? Because in the end, I don't think you're just choosing for you you're choosing for your kids you're choosing for your grandkids you know who, who's this man or who's this woman gonna be are they gonna try to raise saints with me or is co-parenting gonna be like this eternal tug of war emotionally psychologically spiritually financially and so on so um i've blabbed enough uh what are your thoughts in terms of knowing when you're asking too much where to draw that line you know am i am i expecting this person to change in marriage or am i being unrealistic any thoughts there yeah um, I have a lot of thoughts. Yeah, good. Go. <laughs> um, away. um, well, firstly, I think if you have some really wonderful people in your life, I would take your concern to them. Like, hey, mm-hmm. uh, this bo- kind of bothers me. Is this wrong that I'm yeah. bothered by it? What are yeah. your thoughts on it? Talk mm-hmm. to some married couples. Like, yeah. hey, is this normal that this is bothering me? What, it, what could this look like eventually? Yeah. Um, so that's number one. Kind of talk to trusted people who love you. And who want the best for you and can say, yeah, uh, Sandy, that doesn't sound right. Like mm-hmm. that, it's not a good sign. Yeah. Um, and who are able to speak to you. Yeah. And to say, like, you, you, uh, I don't love the phrase, you deserve better. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> you do. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and then I was just chatting with some friends this past week and we kept on coming back to this concept of just. Um, and how we honor each other in friendships and relationships and marriages, um, honoring our, our family, obviously. And I just thought of that as you were kind of asking me that question. Mm-hmm. Is this person honoring you? Yeah. Um, when it comes to something that you really love, but they actually don't love, you, do they yeah. honor you by maybe doing it anyway? I'm not saying yeah. anything dangerous, anything yeah. like that. I'm saying like, yeah. do they hate pickleball? But you yeah. love pickleball, and yeah. so they will honor you by stepping out of themselves yeah. and show you um, the love that they want to enjoy it with you. Yeah. And I love what you said about someone who's your best friend. I think that's such a good um, analogy that we can cling to. Like, yeah. this person is um, a joy to be with. These are my soul. Mm-hmm. And they honor me. Yeah. Um, so those are a couple of things. The other thing was one of my friends, Emily Wilson, who is yeah. Emily Wilson Hassan. Yep. She's so wise and I love her. She um, has shared with me the characteristic that kind of meant the most to her was mm-hmm. is he um, yeah. and that really can like settle into my soul. 
Um, are they kind to uh, the server at the table? Are they kind to um, in the car? Are they road rage? Like these are the actual characteristics that yeah. um, need to be purified by the Lord. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, they'll just build and build and get worse. Yeah. Um, so those are kind of my top my top ones. I love that best friend. Um, yeah. Do they show you honor? Are you well, and then are they kind? Yeah, and I and I think a person will find the answer to those questions in with one word, peace. Like, do you have peace? Like, and, and don't kid yourself with it of being like, no, no, I, I, we can make it work. No, no, I didn't ask if you can make it work. You know, are you really at peace with this? Because if you move forward and you're truly not, I mean, it can really come to bite you. Uh, and so you've got to be honest with yourself and with the people who love you, because a lot of times people are afraid to disclose what's really going on out of fear that if they do to people who love them, that those people are going to reconfirm the lack of peace that's present in your heart that you're just trying to bury and suffocate with just, oh, well, let's look over here and let's focus on this instead of that. Just so to really be still before God and prayer, like, is that that spirit of peace there? Because, you know, sometimes I think women in particular will overlook faults in a guy because sometimes for single women, they're more interested in having kids than they are having a husband. And this isn't always the case. There's plenty of cases where we're like, no, 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 I, I really crave spousal love and companionship. And I, the, the, the relationship with the husband is going to be first. Kids are going to be secondary. Sometimes, in some cases, and it's not most of the case, but sometimes there's some that are like, no, I just want to be a mom so bad. Where can I find a guy to make me a mom? But the challenge is those, those kids will be with you for a span of time, and it's a blessed time. But then when those kids are gone, the vast majority of your marriage, it's just you guys. And that's it. And, and if that hasn't been the primary, primary interest and, and focus of the most important thing, then it's going to be a pretty lonely go, uh, you know, if it's just for the sake of having these kids. I mean, obviously, unbelievable joy while they're in the house, but they're gone before you know it. And then it's like, what do we have here? And so I don't think most people are doing that. Most people like focusing more. I want to find a spouse then kids come later. But uh, I imagine you would probably second the idea that that peace of heart is probably the most important part of the puzzle in terms of answering, does he honor me? Is me? Is he kind? Can I see our life shared together? Yes. And I think oftentimes we can um, confuse peace with like relief. So if there is an instance yeah. where you're like, I don't like that, but I feel relief at the idea of not having conflict with it. Does that make sense, Jason? Like, yeah. I don't like that and I know I should talk about it with this yeah. person, but I hate conflict. So I actually feel at peace with not bringing it up. No. Yeah. That, that's False peace. peace. So, yeah, that's a need to feel better. Um, but yeah. that's not peace. So, yeah, the real um, supernatural peace of the Lord is in this. Like, yeah. I like you the Lord is in it. Yeah, and I, and I think a, a kind of a, a conflict avoidant type of temperament can sometimes pair with a more controlling person who's just like, okay, well, I can get what I want by kind of threatening conflict, and then this person will just give me what I want. And then the person's like, okay, well, I'll just kind of cave in to kind of keep the peace. And you could have peace, but the whole time it's a false peace. You know, it's it's just a truce and a war, so to speak, with two enemy sides. Like, yeah, there's no missiles being fired, but man, that's a that's a tense environment to kind of coexist in, as opposed to an authentic peace. We're like, yeah, we can we can bring up the ugly, and we're not going to cut each other to pieces to get to the other end of the conflict. Like, we can we can argue lovingly, and so. You know, so that, that, you know, I think they say that the, the measure of the success of a relationship isn't so much the frequency of the conflicts and, and how common they are, but the nature of them. You know, like what's going on here? Is it resentment and contempt and attacks and stonewalling and controlling and conflict avoidance and just all these relationship skills that a lot of times they don't develop as young people and they get into marriage is like, whoa, we don't even know how to argue. So, um, but any last thoughts? I've got one one other thought I want to share. But like, any last thoughts in terms of any and any gems or encouragement that you'd have for single guys? You know, maybe in this because we've talked a lot about the girls. How about the guys? Oh man, I would just say step out and breathe brave. Um, I know <laughs> that's hard, and maybe it wasn't even modeled for you. Um, yeah. Maybe you have around that as well. Like, I don't even know how to step up and do this. Um, but I would just encourage you to. Like I said before, make some friends. Make some male friends like Jason who can tell you 
holiday to ask the girls on the date. Um, so yeah, just a thought. Be brave. Um, yeah, I also, I'm curious because I do have some friends, um, who, as you touched on a little bit earlier, maybe will lower their morals, um, just to maybe experience dating. Like, hey, I should date more so that I get more used to it or I practice, so I get better at it. Um, yeah. or, you know, I am just lonely. And so I have to lower my morals just to, companionship and eating with someone. Yeah. Do you have any yeah. to bring your advice um, that maybe I can share with them in terms of how do you keep going when it's so hard and like yeah. morally you're just like uh it feels so good. Yeah. In the moment to want it. Yeah. 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 And, and and a lot of times that's what those passing relationships are is just a just a hit of feeling wanted when you see if you feel so unwantable all the rest of the times. But, you know, it ends up being a false consolation because these serial relationships aren't really training you in love. It's basically training you in the habit of failed relationships. It's like, what did I really learn from there other than it didn't work out, that didn't work out, this didn't work out. And then you feel lonelier afterwards. It's like going to some like sugar binge when you're probably just dehydrated and you just need a big liter of water instead. But, you know, what I would say is that w- what's motivating you? Is it fear? Is it loneliness? If those are your motivating factors, then just don't do it. Uh, you know, you need to be motivated coming from a spirit of, of peace. And let you can feel that ache of loneliness. Let yourself feel that. You know, let yourself sit in that and meet God there and just sit in it with him. You know, one of the things that I recommend is go find some Psalms of Lamentation from the Old Testament. Psalm 88 is a good place to start and just sit there and read it to God because the, the desolation Psalms are awesome because you really get, you have like permission to totally gripe at God. And like, they t- like, this is your fault. And like, why did you do this to me? And like, I'm this because of you, like, it's great. Like you totally get a full license to just fire off both barrels to God and it's real prayer. And so shoot it away. Um, talking to him about your aloneness. And then pray it as Christ a second time, because those are the words he prayed in his passion. And then pray it a third time with him. Okay, let's speak our voices together to the Father in our aloneness. And so you you find an authentic intimacy and an authentic consolation. Because man, the, the false consolations are so easy and so available, whether it's on TikTok or in a bar or this or that. Like it's it's lightning gratification. But it's like a firework, just boom, and then just, just gone. And then you feel lonelier than you were before you binged in the false consolation. And so, you know, that that's a lot of the stuff is just having the, the prudence and praying for the wisdom to discern true consolations, uh, you know, from false consolations. And an, and an image I'll give you, too, in terms of you might look at this whole situation and be like, like, what a mess. Like, I really thought growing up that by the time I got to this age, my life would look like this and my life would look like that. And, and it just doesn't. And it just, it's just this mystery. Like every day, it's this mystery that I'm encountering God. And in the analogy that came to me this morning, I was at mass and the light was just, just like pouring through the stained glass windows. And it reminded me of a, a shell. Um, you know, originally lived in San Diego for a long time. And uh, my favorite shell is the abalone shell. And we were uh, uh, sn- snorkeling in, Aval- in, uh, in, in San Diego and I found one and I, and I brought it. So this is my favorite shell in the world. And I know people looking at it as like, wow, that's, that's really a beautiful shell, Jason. I'm like, I know it is. Because all you're seeing is the, the outside of this thing. But you know what's on the inside is just glorious to show what these things look like. So this is the outside of the abalone shell. I mean, it's not real interesting. But then you shave it down, and it's basically, it looks like an, an opal inside of this thing. And so when you totally get the thing polished up, you know, this is what these things look like. I mean, it's just absolutely yeah. these glorious, you know, little awesome things. So you can find them in La Jolla, um, but don't let them see you taking them. Uh, and so <laughs> these, uh, so to me, it's like, okay, this is the part of your life you see right now. And it's just like this encrusted, messy thing, you know, but the reason to praise God in the mess is because th- th- there's something he's doing underneath it. And I can't tell you what it is. You know, I can't tell you. Well, maybe it's because he wants you to offer up this suffering uh, for the conversion of sinners. And maybe there's going to be an eternal fruit born from your victimhood in these single years that you could have never even conceived uh, of the years of consolation of having the vocation as you want it right now. Like, I, I don't know. Like, it's, it's a big, 
mess. It's a big mystery. But I think th- this type of sacramental imagery to me reminds me of, OK, this is what I see. This is what he's up to. And so this is why we're supposed to actually praise him and give him thanks. Just kind of like in the Maccabees, like this. Yeah, get tongue cut off. Your your arms are missing. You're, you've been scalped and uh, and you're now getting thrown in the frying pan. OK, what do we do? Thank God, because he sees us and he has compassion on us. It's just like, that's the kind of, to me, the, the supernatural level of faith God's extracting from us while we're encountering him on the cross. And so in the midst of the pain of the singleness, just just know that he's at work um, in you. And I don't know if you've got any last notes of, of hope or encouragement for our singles out there. Yeah, just keep going. <laughs> you are seen by the Lord. He sees you and he's with you in it. Uh, that's so beautiful. And uh, yeah, he's got a plan for you. Yeah. Plan. yeah. Now, how can um, women in particular connect with Blessed Is She? How can they get on the newsletter? Is there a way for them to meet with local communities, get them started up online? Uh, tell people where they can connect. Yes, so many places. Yeah, go to blessedisshe.net and you'll find out all the info. If you want to subscribe to our daily reflections, go to blessedisshe.net slash Subscribe um, okay. to find regional groups in your area. Let's say the key.net slash community. Um, we do actually here in Phoenix, we have uh, Let's the She Nights as well. So you can find women anywhere. Um, if you are in the Hodunk area, where, like I don't ever meet anyone, I don't see anyone. We yeah. also have like, virtual connections for you, virtual small groups, and things like that. So we just okay. want to walk with you. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put your link in the show notes first. Um, I'll also put the Patreon on if anyone wants to support the ministry there. I'm also going to put the uh, online Catholic dating sites that we had recommended, those four. Um, we're not sponsored by any of them, so I'm happy to promote all of them equally. Um, and then beyond that, we'll look. I'll put some healing links in terms of the John Paul II Healing Center, catholictherapist.com, Dr. Greg Bataro. So yeah, that, that way, all the stuff that we've kind of thrown out there and peppered at you, um, you can just kind of spend some time, dive into those links and uh, let's let's pray for each other, you know, like because we've got thousands of people watching the podcast. Like, what if we were to just wrap up the show together, all interceding for one another in the pursuit of the vocation for God's will? That way, we're not just like talking about this. We're actually drawing grace upon heaven of graces of conversion, of healing, of encouragement, of hope, of direction, of wisdom. And so we can all just kind of collectively tag team and love each other in the support of pursuing God's holy will for us. So in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit. And we ask you to send your graces upon all those that are listening and striving to know your holy will for their lives. Um, Give them peace, give them healing, give them encouragement and perseverance uh, that they might encounter intimacy with Jesus Christ on the cross through this time and never fail in trusting him and praising him for his goodness, although we might not see the fruit of it just yet. Increase in us trust, and uh, we entrust all of this uh, to the maternal intercession of our ladies. We pray for each other. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Paul II, pray for us, and Joseph, pray for us. And St. Raphael, the Archangel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Jenna, thank you for coming on the program today, and uh, just keep up the wonderful work. Thank you so much, Jason. Good to see you. Thanks. Before you sign off, I want to let you all know about it. Franciscan University of Steubenville, their youth conferences. Now, I've been speaking to these conferences for more than a decade. They're awesome. They're absolutely life changing for the teens. It's uh, three days of talks, of worship, uh, adoration. They've got these events all over the country throughout the entire summer. And so if you're a parent and you want your teen to encounter Christ in a deeper way, maybe you're a youth leader, uh, want your kids to maybe start some fundraising and get the whole youth group to go, or it's just hit the link in the show notes, enter the information, because man, it's going to be an incredible event. God bless.